This is the video that scares everybody. I know, yeah. Because in that picture, so, they just go. took a huge chunk out of the knee. Good. All right, so starting off normally, you open up the incision, and you need to actually be able to see to put the pieces in. So they flip the patella up on the side, and usually you replace that. And here, they take a huge chunk out of bone out on both the femur <laughs> and the tibia. That's not really how we do that. I, I typically tell patients, this is how we used to do it, or you can do it like this. Sometimes I do that in Europe, but here in the United States, that's not how we do it. So this is like, you said, this, this, this one really scares This is people. the one that scares people, because yeah. they think that, well, you have to amputate my leg in the middle of surgery, and that's, mm. that's not quite true. What we're doing here, typically, when I'm doing this surgery, when a modern surgeon does this, you're, you're taking small slivers of bone, about eight millimeters or less. Mm. Here, they just cut off the bottom half of the femur there. <laughs> Uh, you can do that. It just doesn't feel natural. So see that huge gap? Yeah. You know, that's that's what people are worried about. Now, mm. this part is right, where you put something into the tibia, mm -hmm. uh, and then you put something on the femur. This is a little different mm -hmm. design-wise. Um, but then, then, yeah, then it moves back and forth. And there's a metal piece that goes in. That's the part that's coming in. That's the patella. Mm -hmm. Of course, your tendons are normally attached to it. There they go. They came back. Gotcha. And then... And to oh. put it all back together. Oh. It's that easy. It's you know? that easy, man. Because, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of families are like, literally, they just go and they Google. Yes, I know. Knee replacement. Oh, my, you know, my dad has knee replacement a year ago. He was sending me videos every day. Like, it's like this. And I'd be like, Dad, no. And then it causes fear. Like, and they're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, now seeing that, I can yeah. see why. <laughs> see why. This is showing the knee with arthritis. Hmm. The models always have it as red, and it's kind of pink when it gets down to bone. Uh, now, this part right here is showing you when all the pieces are in, what does it actually look like? Hmm. Of course, none of your muscles and tendons are in this picture. We like to leave all of those as much as we can. There are some that are either worn out from arthritis or we have to take out to put some of the pieces in, but typically, all of your tendons we, we keep there. Usually the ACL has to be sacrificed or is already gone. Hmm. Um, but the PCL, the way I do it is we like to keep it as much as we can. Your MCL, your LCL, we keep those pieces unless they're worn out and we compensate for it. Sweet. So that's the patella up front, you got your femur up top, tibia on the bottom. It's typical incision, you're making it over the front of the knee. And then you kind of spread the skin out underneath and then you get into the joint itself. You flip over the kneecap like that. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we'll replace that, especially if there's damage. And then you make cuts that look just like this. So a flat cut on the tibia, the bottom bone, a flat cut across the patella and you'll replace that with what's called a button. And then on the femur, you make several different angled cuts where you're just taking a few millimeters of bone off so that you can basically put an end cap on either one of them. Mm -hmm. But you can see that the ligaments are still there. They're still in place and we depend on those for the knee to function properly. Mm -hmm. So then this is what the pieces look like once you put it in. And there are many different brands, but they all are pretty similar in how they're designed. And that's kind of what it looks like inside the bone. You have to anchor it inside the bone in some way, either with a little peg or um, a, a bigger peg or cement. Sometimes you can actually make it so that the bone grows into mm -hmm. it, but they have to stick to the bone somehow. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it moves. It glides nice and smoothly and we try and keep the basic mechanics of the knee once we replace it and put it together. That's awesome. So that cement, I'm just curious now, you mentioned the, the cement that's going in there. Mm -hmm. Right in there, what does that entail? Like, is it something that, like, it grows into the bone or how does that work? So curious. There, there are basically two main ways to get something to stick to bone. And the most common way is to cement it in place, which mm -hmm. is, I, I'd describe as glue. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a grout is probably more accurate, uh, but it's, it bonds both to the implant and it, you know, bones are very porous. And so if you take it and pressurize it, it will get into the bone and then it kind of unitizes it together. Hmm. Uh, that's how we've done it for a long time mm. in, in both hips and knees. Now, we are now switching over, especially in, in the hips in the United States, most of the time we're not using cement at all. Mm. Um, we're starting to do that in the knee as well. Mm. The reason for that is, it, theoretically, if it, if the bone grows into the metal, into the implant, it might be able to last you the rest of your life. Mm. 
which is ideal, mm -hmm. and especially as our patients are getting younger, that's the way we want to go. Right, right. Wow. So here's our, our model, and this is what the muscles look like underneath. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of muscles and there's a lot of planes. There's a lot of ways to get to the hip. Uh, the way that I do it and the way that a lot of more modern surgeons are doing this is going from the front. Uh, what that does is it takes advantage of a plane in between muscles instead of cutting them off. Mm. So that's what your skeleton looks like. That's where you're ultimately trying to get is to the ball and socket hip joint. There's a lot of complex anatomy around there. There's the acetabulum, which is the socket, the femoral head, which is the ball, and the femur, which is you know the rest of your leg, obviously. But you have to make sure that you're explaining those terms to patients mm. as you're going through it. Um, or they'll say bless you. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so that you can see that's how it moves, but as you get arthritis, the ball isn't round, the socket isn't spherical, you know, pieces of them can break away or you can get bone spurs that will interfere with motion, the hip gets stiff, um, and it, it, sometimes, depending on the condition, it can even collapse. So that's kind of what you're dealing with, that's what you're trying to fix. So then you have to make an incision on the skin, um, and this is showing you those muscle planes and the way that they're gonna get to it. Um, typically, even an anterior approach, you'll still have it's the incision sort of on the front, but sort of on the side uh, versus in the back, which is what most people are used to. Those are the muscles you want to leave intact, the, the rotator muscles of the hip. And then as your hamstrings, you should hopefully never see those, but you have to make sure that they're intact as you're going through and doing the approach. And, and these are the rotator muscles. The, if you're going from the back, you cut those off. These are your adductor muscles. These are the ones that bring your hip across your body. Those you should be able to keep alone in, in most, most approaches. And this is you know, your rectus muscle. This is a hip flexor and also helps extend your knee. This one you will see, so you have to be careful with it. So kind of on the front, kind of on the side. You enter in through, you get between these two layers of muscles, and then you can see the hip. Uh, that's what it looks like when you're all said and done, where you have the brand new stem, the ball, the socket, and the liner in the socket. When you're all finished, it looks pretty much like that. And it actually can be pink, mm, believe it or not. Really? Yeah, they're, we typically are using a, a ball that's made out of a ceramic, and so you take the old ball off, um, and you actually don't need it anymore after that. You could use it for some spare bone if you needed. Then you prepare the socket where you put in a, a metal socket with a liner, then you put a stem inside the femur with a, a new ball on top. And there are varying sizes of all these, mm -hmm. um, and so you can customize to the patient exactly what they need. And in this model in particular, they've made it such that it's what we call press fit, so mm -hmm. the, the bone should grow into these implants. Like exactly, <laughs> it, it, it does make that noise. Is it really? It, yeah, if no you way. do it right. What's nice about doing these from the front is patients tend to bounce back a little quicker. A, a, a hip surgery, it, you know, a replacement is a great surgery. Mm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Lancet Journal, but it's one of the big mm. scientific journals, mm. you know, kind of like New England Journal of Medicine mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. just heard of. They said that the hip replacement surgery is the surgery of the century because of how much it has brought people's quality of life back. Cool. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you do it from the front, the back, the side, a year, everybody's doing better. Yeah.